blemished or cracked or even a piece of a letter isn't there, the entire Torah is considered lacking and cannot be used. One little letter, a little piece of a yud, a little piece of an olive. We the Jewish people are the same way. If even one brother, one sister, one friend, one relative, one Jew whose name we don't even know is missing, then we as a people are lacking. We're not complete. So there are those that understand that and those that don't. And those that are willing to put their lives every single day on the line to go and find those Jews who are missing, who are blemished, who are not all there, so that we can have a more complete Torah every year until Emir Tzeshem Mashiach will come and there will be no lacking whatsoever. In Markham, I'd like to introduce you to two of the stars, as I consider them, of the Jewish people in Markham. And then I'd like to introduce you to the real stars behind the stars. Well, the two stars are the two rabbis, the people who have no hours. they got to work all hours. <laughs> Someone told me they only have two shifts, from 9 to 9 and from 9 to 9, and they have to work both shifts. And ladies and gentlemen, let's face it, they don't get too much recognition, and we ought to take a minute out to recognize, first of all, Rabbi Avram Plotkin. And you know, it's nice to have an assistant when you do a miracle. Moshe had to... Uh, Moshe wanted to bring Aaron along with him. Especially out there in the world in Markham, 20,000 Jews. That's a lot of people. That's a big, big number to be responsible for, to try and reach every single one. And when they do a census like that, that doesn't include every single child. So it's really 40,000 or 50,000. So Rabbi Plotkin has expanded this year and brought in from New York, ladies and gentlemen, Rabbi Mayor Gitlin. I say the stars behind the stars. The stars behind the stars have to cook the food and raise the family and push their husbands to learn and push their husbands to daven and push their husbands onwards and onwards and maybe get even less recognition than their husbands, except in the place where we really have to get recognition. Ladies and gentlemen, the two Rebbitsons who are really the life, the spirit behind the miracle of Markham, could we please recognize Rebbitson Goldie Plotkin and Rebbitson Esther Gitlin. I'll conclude my remarks for this segment by saying we're still really within the spirit of Adar, the spirit of Purim, the spirit of Shushan. Somebody not feeling well? My <laughs> small rodents, it happens out here in Mark. I'll take care of you. Okay, it's someone whose mom didn't pick him up the Uncle Moshe concert. But <laughs> still time on. A Shova Saveda is a very important mitzvah. <laughs> you know, really, we're in the spirit of celebration, which is why we can joke. And uh, we're in the spirit of celebration of Purim as well. And Purim celebrates the fact that the Jewish people, we all know that the Megillah says, Kimu Vikiblu, the Jewish people got up and reaffirmed their acceptance in the Torah. But if, for those of us who could follow in a Megillah, it was spelled Kibel, not Kiblu. It was spelled in the singular, not in the plural. To teach us that we have to accept the Torah as one people. That some are called upon to be a Mordechai, the leader of the Jewish people. Some are called upon to be an Esther, to sacrifice and step forward and be a leader of the Jewish people. Some of us are called upon to be as the Adonim in the Mishkan, to be the supporters, to be those, to those who give financial support, some to be the musicians, some to be the rabbis, some to be the printers. And in the miracle in Markham, there are so many people involved. And really, that's part of the miracle. So in that spirit of celebration, I'd like to call upon a young Jewish fellow who I've worked with for a long time, hails from a small town in Canada, but now from Montreal, recently at a concert for disadvantaged children in New York. He received the most touching ovation 
that maybe I've ever heard anyone receive. It's for a song he wrote called Zaidi, which touched so many hearts. Ladies and gentlemen, he's played from one corner of the world to the other, and soon may he merit to make the music for Mashiach. Ladies and gentlemen, composer, singer, musician, extraordinaire, Moshe Yes! this off with a little bit of Jewish history. At the foot of Mount Sinai, there were 12 tribes to the Jewish people. Later on in our history, 10 of those tribes became lost, and the remaining two tribes have recently been discovered to be alive and well in New York City. One of the tribes is called Shimon, and the other one is called uh, Garfunkel. Right. Now, of the tribe of Garfunkel, there is a descendant who lives next to the golf course on the outskirts of Orlando, Florida. And this first song is just about him. If I can get a little bit more guitar level from our good sound man up there. Well, we're waiting here. One second. You got some more guitar there for me, Harry? I'll do it, okay. He stood five foot ten in his double knit slacks, checking all the merchandise on his rack, with an alligator sewed to his golfing shirt. Everybody knows you don't give no dirt to Jack Schwartz. Every morning at dawn, you could see him arise in suburbia from a bed king size with a golf bag made from fine leather soft. Everybody knows that you don't need Jack Schwartz. When the young kipper arrived, he just wasn't seen. He was out putting round on the 13th green. He knew how to swing, and he knew how to slice. He was golfing away his good Jewish life, Jack Schwartz. Well, we're all going to miss his beloved soul. Lightning struck on the 14th hole. His life was just a big sand trap because he never overcame his handicap, Jack Schwartz. And there's a tombstone now by the 18th hole where they buried his dearly departed soul. And I guess it had to happen sooner or later. He was buried in a tullus with an alligator, Jack Schwartz. Oh, Jack Schwartz. Oh, Jack Schwartz. Oh, Jack Schwartz. Thank you. With your permission, I would like to uh, reintroduce myself to all of you. My name is Moshe Yes. My last name is spelled Y-E-S-S. -S. The second S is silent. And whenever I tell people my name, they, they usually ask me two questions. The first one is, is yes really your last name? And the answer to that is yes. My grandfather was born in Lodz, Poland, where the family name was Yeich or Yeich. We're not certain. And he immigrated to England, and the immigration officer couldn't spell the name Yeish or Yeich, and so he wrote down Y-E-S-S, -S, and that's how I have this ridiculous name. The second question I'm always being asked by people is, 
were you always religious? And the answer to that is no. People say, what happened to you? I kind of got tired of telling my story over and over and over again, so I put my story into a simple song, which I sing over and over and over again. job in the city, working for the dollar every night and day. This old rabbi told me you were made to be holy. Get yourself a Bible, son, see what it says. Instead of buying her some roses, I went and bought the five books of Moses. I've been learning, I've been learning, I've been learning from the Torah. Read a bit about creation, the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve. Cain slew Abel, Noah's ark was stable. The more I've read, well, the more I believe. The reason that we got big noses is to keep them in the Bible to Moses. I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm learning from the Torah. Pretty soon I started praying I started wearing senses and I covered my head Started keeping Shabbos, my dad bought me a talus It all came together with the Torah I read And if my children have big noses Want to see them in the Bible to Moses Keep learning, get learning Learning from the Torah Ladies and gentlemen, with your permission, I would like to do something which is normally not done at a public concert like this. I would like to uh, share with all of you some very personal events from my life because it's from these events that the inspiration for many of the songs that I have written has come. Allow me to go back, please, about uh, 11 years ago. 11 years ago, to put it very bluntly, I did not appear at all the way I appear in front of all of you this evening. I was, in those days, living in Hollywood, California, working as a recording studio and a nightclub musician. And in those days, I had very loud red pointed cowboy boots. I had faded blue jeans with sparkly silver stuff down the side. I did not have this massive undergrowth below my chin. I had a very big leather cowboy hat with a gold chain around it and a big gold disc in the front that used to jingle every time I shook my head. This was me 11 years ago in Hollywood, California. And uh, due to a very minimal Jewish education as a child, around the age of 28 or 29, I started to pick up a book here and a book there about the basics of our Jewish religion. And after six months of study, I pretty much fancied myself a world-class Talmudic scholar on the topic of Judaism. And I walked into a storefront synagogue on Fairfax Avenue in Los Angeles and met the first rabbi that I had seen in many, many years. And the conversation between the two of us went something like this. I approached the rabbi and I said, uh, Excuse me, rabbi. Uh, I have been doing some research into the second temple period of our people's history. Would you be kind enough to tell me, please, where did the Levites store the musical instruments in the second temple? Well, first of all, the rabbi looked at the pointed red cowboy boots. He quickly glanced at the faded blue jeans and he paid particular attention to this dangling participle on the front of the leather cowboy hat. And he said two words to me I will never forget. He said to me, you Jewish? And I said, certainly. He said, did you put on film today? I said, no. He says, come here, you. And he slaps me to the back of the show and he wraps me up in film. 
he's a Lubavitcher, his name is Naftali Estula. Anyways, to make a long story interminable, I said, uh, Rabbi, it's uh, been many years uh, since I've been in the shul, I'm feeling very rusty as a Jew. He says, ah, come to shul every day, you'll wear off the rust real quick. Well, to be honest, it was awkward, not knowing what was happening in the prayer book and the sitter and Adadan and everything. And it was from that awkwardness that this next song found its inspiration. Yawn in the prayer book blues. Am I supposed to sit or stand in a set of God blues? Well, my folks sent me to hater when I was just a child. But instead of learning olive bays, I was out there running wild. I got to what page are we on in the prayer book blues? And the guy right next to me, he's taking a snooze. But I don't know what I'm reading. I don't know what to speak. God spoke to us in Hebrew. But to me, the thing is Greek. I've got my kid knows less than me in the prayer book blues. And it's not too nice to see in the synagogue blues. So it's a hater for you, young man. Learn your other base. Don't you dare take after me with egg all on your face. I got to what page are we on in the prayer book blues? Am I supposed to sit or stand in the synagogue blues? Well, I guess I'll see you later, cause I'm going back to Hater. I got to what page are we on in the prayer book blues? Da 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 da! Hey, what page are we on in the prayer book blues? Da 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 da! What page are we on in the prayer book blues? Uh, allow me to go back eight years before I met Rabbi Estulin in Los Angeles. I was still living in Hollywood and I had taken upon myself eight years before I met the rabbi the personal commitment to learn how to sing country music. I did not realize, that, I realized at the time that, that that would entail eight years of non-stop travel around the western half of North America. And if there's anybody in our audience tonight who has the secret fantasy to become the next Kenny Rogers or Dolly Parton. <laughs> Can't imagine anyone who would become Dolly Parton. <laughs> I am going to save you eight years of nonstop travel and share with all of you the only three things you have to know if you want to successfully sing a country song in front of people. Lesson one pertains to the guitar. Every country song that has ever been written or will come to be written has the same first chord on the guitar. It is this chord. Lesson number two. Every country song that has ever been written or will come to be written has the same first word. It is this one. Well, now, I hope you appreciate I'm saving you eight years of service by giving this all to you. Lesson number three is a little bit more subtle. If you want to successfully do a country song in front of people, you have to develop a certain amount of what I call a countrified attitude. You gotta mosey on up to your microphone like you just got down from your horse. And you want to get a weather-beaten, rough-and-tumbled life expression on your face. You can accomplish this artificially by squinting your eyes and increasing the wrinkle lines at the edges of the face. And just to show the people that you're a rough-and-tumble guy and you have a mean streak, you can snarl at the people in the first couple of rows. That's the psychology, and to top it off, for dramatic effect, you look up about 60 degrees to the right when you say the word, well. Now, 
the first time that I tried to do, well, let me show you how this goes in its most pristine form. This is how it's done. Well, the first time that I tried to do this professionally was in a city called Minot, North Dakota. Avoid it. It's not exactly the cultural hub of the Western Hemisphere. And I was there at a place called the Club 52. You and your offspring should never know from such a place. And there I was on stage in front of real live cowboys and Indians about to make my country music debut and little did I realize at that point in time that my Jewish heritage was going to get in the way and cause me to stumble. This is what transpired in my knot on that awesome night. Val and the cowboys started scratching their heads. What's with the weirdo up on the stage? Ooh, I don't think he's one of us, Chuck. So I got desperate. I thought maybe I'd try a Hasidic approach. No. That did not work. So there I was, struggling with the words of my rabbi. Are you going to be a Jew who happens to be a musician? Or are you going to be a musician who happens to be a Jew? And this next song came along in the secular world with a very relevant message for me. On a warm summer's evening, on a train bound for nowhere, I met up with a gambler. We were both too tired to sleep. We took turns of staring at the window in the darkness. The boarding mower took us. He began to speak. He said, "Son, I made a life out of reading people's faces." Knowing what the cards were by the way they held their eyes. If you don't mind me saying, I can see that you're out of aces for a taste of your whiskey. I'm gonna give you some advice. You gotta know where to hold him. Know when to fold him. Know when to walk away. Know when to run. You don't count your money. When you're sitting at the table, the big time on up accounting. When the deal's done, ah, the ah. Little the gambler knows the secret to surviving is knowing what to throw away, knowing what to keep. Cause every hand's a winner, and every hand's a loser, and the best that you can count on is to die. When you sleep, you gotta know when to hold him, know when to fold him, know when to walk away, know when to run, you know, count your money. When you're sitting at the table, a big time and up for counting. When the deal is done, you gotta know when to hold him. Know when to hold him. Know when to walk away. Know when to run. You don't count your money. But when you're sitting at the table, a big time and up for counting. When the deal is done. I was struggling with the Lubavitch prayer book, Tilis Hashem. The English translation hadn't come up yet. Gives you an idea of how old I am. And one day, in the Shemona Esrit, the word Yerushalayim jumped out. And I ran to Rabbi Estulim. And I said to him, Rabbi, I've got to go to Israel. And he looked deep into my eyes and he said to me, it's in your heart, you're going to do it. And sure enough, three months later, I was holding a one-way airplane ticket to our holy city. And I was quite fortunate because about four or five days after my arrival in Yerushalayim, I found a very humble, one-bedroom, air-conditioned apartment in a part of the city called Gu'ula 
The reason I refer to the air conditioning is because it consisted of a window with no glass in it. It was one of these indoor, outdoor decorating schemes you read about. Um, I am not complaining about that little apartment. My life turned around in that place, the music. I was playing and changed from rock and roll into Jewish music. And more about what happened in the apartment later on, but of all the songs that came into my life in that apartment, to this day, this is the one. My Zadie, live with us. In my parents' home, he used to laugh, he put me on his knee. And he spoke about his life in Poland. He spoke, but with a bitter memory. And he spoke about the soldiers who would beat him. And they laughed at him, they tore his long black coat. And he spoke about a synagogue that they burned down and the crying that was heard beneath the smoke but Sadie made us laugh Sadie made us sing and Sadie made a kiddish Friday night and Sadie oh my Sadie how I love your soul and Sadie used to teach me wrong from right. His eyes lit up when he would teach me Torah. And he taught me every line so carefully. And he spoke about our slavery in Egypt. And how God took us out to make us free. But winter went by, summer came along, I went to camp to run and play, and when I came back home, they said, Sadie's gone, and all his books were packed and stored away, and I don't know how or why it came to be. Happened slowly over many years. We just stopped being Jewish like my Zadie was. And no one cared enough to shed a tear. But Zadie made us laugh. Zadie made us sing. And Zadie made us Seder takes up nights. Oh my Zadie, how I love him so And Zadie used to teach me wrong from right And many winters went by And many summers came along And now my children sit in front of me And who will be the Zadie of my children? Who will be the Sadies of our children? Who will be the Sadies if not we? And Sadie made us laugh, Sadie made us sing, and Sadie made a kiddish Friday night. And Sadie, oh my Sadie, how I Turn the house up, house lights up just a little bit, please, because I want to ask a question of the audience.
Okay. Now, if you have been to a Jewish summer camp in North America, one of the inevitable things that has happened to you is that you have learned this next song, and you have learned it this way. There's a certain technique to the song that usually everybody gets together in a big group, and they start to swing back and forth from the right to the left, or from your perspective, from the left to the right. And you get this mushy, communal feeling that comes over you and everybody gets all syrupy inside and spontaneous love for everybody. They start to sing this song. Some of you are singing in Braille. <laughs> I want to thank the camp choir for coming here to... Okay, that's quite enough. Now, the reason that I brought this song to your attention again is because it relates to my being in Yerushalayim. I met a Jewish musical historian who told me that an awful lot of the hit Jewish songs of about 50, 60 years ago originally were folk songs that were taken from the host countries that we lived in over in Europe. Seems that what would happen is a Jewish individual would walk by an establishment and a local folk song would come out of the window and he'd take it home and change the words a little bit and call it his own and turn it into a Jewish song. This technique of borrowing someone else's chord and melodic ideas changing the words and calling it your own. In classical musical terminology, this process is referred to as theft. <laughs> now, it is not my intention here tonight to, God forbid, slander Jewish music, but rather to, to explain with all of you the, the, the evolutionary process of our music. We just did this North American Hine Matova Menayim song. And I would like to show you how the local music has affected our Jewish music specifically in South America, where Kanina Hora, they too send Jewish kids to Jewish summer camps, and they too sing Hine Matobu Menayim, but this is how it's done in South America. Shiva, 
And I finally started to learn some of the basics of Judaism, what to do, what not to do. Do not drink the Mayim Achronim. And uh, as a result of the kindness of the Lubavitcher Rabbi in Los Angeles, today, Kanaimura, there are six little yeses running around my house. And they are all learning in a Lubavitch school in Montreal. These are six little yeses. They all have beards and little guitars. And they all run around the house singing. And uh, the biggest blessing of my life is my wife, Sharon. And uh, I need to connect all of this to the miracle in Markham because on a day-to-day -day basis, doctors, college students connect with Lubavitcher Rebbeim all over the world who are doing the work of the Rebbe Shlita and they change lives. And I know that you've been asked before to applaud Rabbi Plotkin and his organization. Could I ask you again? Let's give them a nice round of applause. For One last story from the yeshiva, which explains why I appear the way I do in front of you this evening. About three months after in the Baal Tshuva yeshiva that I was there, one of my rabbis pulled me over. I became quite friendly with him. And he said to me, Moshe. And I said, yes. He said, Moshe, why don't you grow a beard? And I said, what? He said, yeah, why don't you grow a beard? And I said, what on earth for? He said, well, according to our Kabbalistic wisdom, our mystical wisdom, if a man grows a beard, it's supposed to bring some divine mercy, some rachamim into his life. So I started to consider my financial situation and the cost of razor blades and shaving cream in Israel and decided, what can you lose? And a few months later, I was on 8th Avenue in New York City and in a window was this kind of a hat. And I bought the hat. And you know that between the beard and the hat, an experience has entered my life that I will probably have to bear in a may of an S ring. Wherever I am in public, at least four times an hour, a total stranger will approach me and say, Any, anybody ever tell you you look like the guy from Fiddler on the Roof? And I try to be polite, you know, and I say, no, no, you're the first person who's ever brought that to my attention, sir. In the last 12 minutes, you're the first individual. So your part in this last song goes like this. You've got two parts. Clap, 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 clap. Now when I point at everybody, I want everyone to hear to give me a real good, juicy, oi! Here we go. If I were a rich man, yup a bubba bye, yum a ba 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 bye. All day long I would bitty bitty bye. If I were a wealthy man, I wouldn't have to work hard. Yup a bubba bye, yum a ba 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 bye. If I were a bitty bitty rich man, I'd go to the title, title man. I'd build a big tall house with a room by the dozen right in the middle of the town. A fine tin roof with real wooden floors below. There would be one long staircase just going up and one even longer coming down. And one bar leading nowhere just for show. That was if I were a rich man, yip a ba 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 yip a ba 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 All day long I was bitty bitty bum. If I were a wealthy man, I wouldn't have to work hard. Yip a ba 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 yip a ba 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 If I were a bitty bitty rich, hey, I don't tell the title title man. And Lord, who made the lion and the lamb? I should be 
could I have? Who would it spoil some vast eternal plan? If I were, I will be Ladies and gentlemen, Moshe Yes! Let's bring back for one more. Good boy, come on, one more. Hashem once made an angel And he gave him Quite a chore Go and search the whole wide world And bring back to my door The thing that is most valuable The thing I cherish most I'll let you back in heaven then Said the Lord of hosts The angel flew the whole wide world Till a twinkle caught his eye It came from a golden box With diamonds piled high He flew the box to heaven And the gate man said to him Yes it certainly is a treasure, but a shell won't let you in. And so the angel flew the world again, and this time to a war. And he saw an act of bravery like none he'd seen before. Soldier jumped upon a bomb to save the lives of friends. And with the first drop of the soldier's blood, the angel flew again. The keeper of the gate told him, were it up to me, I'd let you in right now with that drop of blood I see, but the Lord of hosts has told me that I cannot let you in until the utmost precious, cherished thing is brought back here to him. And the angel flew the world again till he saw a sinner's face. Covered by a Thomas, which was hiding his disgrace. And from a deep felt sense of shame, something started to appear. And the angel flew with all his might, and he grabbed that precious tear. The gates of heaven opened up, and light filled up the the Holy One Himself took the teardrop and He cried, My house is always open, says the mighty Lord of hosts, and a teardrop of repentance is the thing I cherish most.